Welcome to our Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live. I'm Kimberly Carroll, and I am the director of Animal Justice Academy. Our topic today is what the polls say about plant-based eating. We have with us Amy Morris from the Vancouver Humane Society. From here on out, we'll refer to as VHS, and Kimberly de Oliveira from VegTO. So welcome, welcome, my dear friends. You can just give a wave, and we will we will actually um, put you on spotlight very shortly. But first, I need to give a little introduction of you um, while Kirsten puts us on spotlight. So first of all, um, I, I, and I just want to say to you wonderful beings that have joined us, I, we really appreciate you taking out this time, and we also are welcoming those of you that are watching the replay. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about the power of polls in vegan and animal rights advocacy and discussing the details of, of the two new exciting Angus Reid polls out of Toronto and Vancouver. Um, I want to give you a, a more official bio on our wonderful guests here today. Today. Kimberly de Oliveira is VegTO's executive director. She's been a committed vegan for nine years and trans transitioned from an om omnivorous diet after learning about veganism and its positive impacts on human health, the environment, and well uh, animal welfare. Going vegan is the best decision she's ever made. Woo! Um, Kimberly's committed to supporting the growth of the movement towards positive plant-based living and works with the team at VegTO to create spaces where long-term vegans and veg-curious Torontonians alike can come together in choosing a more compassionate way of life. As a Black vegan, she continues to deepen her understanding and learnings around intersectionality to better support and amplify others and strengthen the movement through diversity. We love that, Kimberly. Welcome, darling. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Oh, so good to have you here. Um, I, I haven't seen your face in person remote recently enough, so this is the closest I'm going to get for now. Well, we're going to change that. Uh, yes, it's, yes. Wonderful, it's always so wonderful to see you, always wonderful to be uh, with your energy, and I'm we're so excited to be with the whole Academy here today and, and just to see all of your faces. I'm just going to go pour a glass of wine, and then we, we've got that wine date figured out. <laughs> Sounds is it good. too early, folks? <laughs> the, the folks in Netherlands, in the Netherlands and Belgium are saying, no, no, I'm, I'm drinking as we go. Um, and I want to introduce now Amy Morris, um, who is the executive director of the Vancouver Humane Society, VHS, with an organizational mission to expose animal abuse and assist individuals, businesses, and governments to end animal suffering, cruelty, and exploitation. Amy has a Master of Public Policy degree from Simon Fraser University and has work experience auditing slaughterhouses in Canada and laboring on animal agriculture farms in New Zealand. She's previously worked with the BC, SP, uh, BC SPCA, designing advocacy campaigns for domesticated and wild animals, and has had the opportunity to uh, attend National Farm Animal Care Council meetings while in that role. She's been on the inside of NFAC, oh my God, Amy, <laughs> and you survived to tell the tale, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you, Amy. And you know what, I, I in case people aren't familiar with VHS, um, definitely the most progressive humane society in, in Canada. Um, I have admired your work for a long time, Amy. Uh, and I, we've, I know I've done um, collaborated with VHS on a few different things over the years, and uh, you've been wonderful collaborators. And VegTO, same goes uh, with VegTO, uh, has done wonderful work um, here in the Toronto area over the years and, and beyond. You, you folks have really expanded um, in the last few years to really take on some amazing aspects of the vegan movement. Um, so I'm just really happy to have both of you and your organizations here today. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so let's let's dive in. Um, I, for, you know, I, I'm gonna get us to dig into a lot of details about your polls in a bit. But first of all, I just talk about polls as a strategy in our movement. Um, First of all, can you both tell us a little bit about the polls that you commissioned, um, some of the details about them, uh, so we just get a, a bit of a lay of the land. So Amy, we're going to start with you on that question. Oh, oh, I think we lost Amy. Oh, no. Okay, we're, Kimberly, we're going to start with you on that question. 
Well, I'm still here. So thank you yeah, so much. That's good. <laughs> uh, so we had about just over a thousand respondents throughout the GTA, and we wanted to make sure that we had a good mix of genders and ages. And we sort of emphasized folks um, under 30 because, you know, uh, data suggests that the growth in this movement is happening increasingly um, uh, with younger folks. And so we wanted to make sure that their voices were represented in the data as well. Mm -hmm. And now, and it was an Angus Reid poll, is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So it's Angus Reid is kind of one of the heaviest hitters with official um, uh, polls. And so uh, I think that's important for folks. To it was know absolutely that. important. Yeah. Just for credibility and reach and, you know, being able to provide us with the sort of audience that we were looking to, to, uh, you know, engage with. Mm hmm. Amazing. So uh, I want to know a little bit about what it was that inspired you folks to do a poll. They're expensive. They're not, you know, and they're and they take a lot of um, work. So what was it that made made the organization feel like this is something we should we should spend some time on? Definitely. And everything you said is true from our from where we were sitting. We are um, an organization that is. Uh, welcoming and emphasizes positive experiences as part of our mission. And we really wanted to be able to meet folks where they are. And what that means is we're not only, you know, supporting existing vegans in deepening their, their advocacy, deepening their experience, but we're also looking to speak to folks who have recently made the decision to go vegan or who are on that journey of reducing their consumption, thinking through these issues, and want to make change in their life as well. And sometimes, particularly that cohort of individuals, um, are sometimes difficult to get information on and to really understand what they're thinking and what their motivations are. And so the poll was a really uh, great opportunity, we felt, as the organization to reach some of those folks who may be reducing consumption or considering issues around animal welfare, welfare or environmental impact and to understand understand them and their motivation so that we can adapt our strategies, our programs, our voice uh, to, to speak to those individuals. Mm, yeah, you know, um, Kimberly, we had uh, the Faunalytics crew on here on an Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live probably just a couple of months ago. And they, you know, they were talking about the whole reason for them existing is the lack of, of good long-term data in the animal rights and vegan movement. So um, I think, you know, because we're so passion-driven in this movement, we, we there's so, so few of us and we care so deeply and we're just trying to get stuff done. But having that data, like, how's yes. that been for you? Like, since you've had that data, like, I, I believe you used it in an open letter to, you know, all the C40 mayors last, um, last summer when, uh, you know, that was signed on by 200 other organizations. So I think you've been finding all sorts of amazing ways to use this data, right? Definitely, definitely. And also we've had an op-ed posted um, and we're looking at a sort of um, alternative ways to, to use the data to make database decisions and in, in how we uh, plan programs and events and, and reach folks as well. And as an organization, we definitely want to reach into more work around advocacy and the, the results are helping us sort of formulate our plans and, and providing direction there as well. We did a full webinar on the results back in September with all of our uh, cousin sister organizations uh, here in the GTA and beyond that are focused on different aspects of this movement. And that is available at veg.ca slash poll. So you can listen to the complete conversation, the Q and A and the entire webinar uh, over there. Again, that's veg.ca slash poll. So yes. what I'm Ina's, got, Ina's you. got it in there right now. And actually, before we go okay. there, Kimberly, um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, you actually did give questions to some of your cousin sister organizations. Sure. So tell us about that. Well, we recognize that, as you said, we're all passionate. We're all um, driven to make uh, improve the lives of animals and humans and improve the conditions in which we find ourselves when it comes to climate impact. And we see our other organizations in our space that are doing this work and focusing and, and emphasizing different aspects of veganism, animal activism, et cetera. And the reason that we shared the poll and wanted to bring in other organizations and have them ask questions that were meaningful for their work 
um, was twofold. One, because we wanted them to have that data so they could use that in their, their directions and their strategies as well. And the second is because um, as a sort of a nonprofit leader, I, I know better than anyone how sometimes we just sort of have our heads down and we're focused on, on our work. And we really thought this was an opportunity for us to just step back and, and look at the sector and see all of the amazing work that's being done and come together because we really do believe that um, we are strong but growing moves, a small but growing movement and um, coming together really improves our strength and sharing our learnings really enhances our ability to do our work. Amazing. And can you tell um, us a little bit about what it's like for you to design a poll? Like, what was it like? Like, is it hard? Like, do you like how how much is involved in that? Well, we were very fortunate that we were partnered with a an excellent um, uh, individual at Angus Reid who really walked us through the steps and helped us design things and you know, ask questions in ways that sort of allowed for flow. Uh, we did some branching where if you were sort of identified early on as an omnivore, that you would be directed to a suite of questions. Whereas if you identified as vegan or vegetarian, you'd be directed a different question. So it really allowed us to maximize the poll and get the most information we could from those different cohorts. And uh, then it was collaborative with um, our board of directors, with other stakeholders at the organization. And of course, with our uh, sister organizations as well. Amazing. So Amy, we got Kimberly to explain a lot about what was happening um, with their poll. So I'm going to sort of put you on the hot seat a little bit to ask you some of the same questions I asked her. Um, so Great. first of all, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired VHS to get on board the poll train? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in 2021, we put a report forward to the city of Vancouver around uh, essentially the impact that reducing the kind of offerings of the city by 20% uh, from animal based to plant based could make a really significant difference when it comes to GHGs and and other kind of climate related impacts. And so they passed a motion for staff to a, a look into it essentially so they didn't commit to it fully but they they saw the value of it and we recognize that there is also an impact to to do the same kind of data analysis and take it from an institution level down to an individual level mm -hmm. and so we decided to do a poll specifically looking at consumption habits of people in bc and the plan is to make a cost benefit analysis um, for individuals so to see the value that that reducing um, kind of GHG impacts and and also reducing some of the costs can have as related to adopting a more plant-based diet. And since we we're already going to do that polling, we just threw in a bunch of other questions. Uh, we were very grateful for VegTO's uh, kind of initial <laughs> plan. So we worked with the same polling company. We used five of the same questions because we were curious if we'd have the same results or not. And then we had uh, six additional questions beyond that. Amazing. And, and so tell me, um, was it uh, polling all over British Columbia or more the uh, greater Vancouver, Vancouver area? Uh, it was, it was the kind of greater lower mainland area. Um, and it was 803 people polled to make sure that the data would be statistically significant. It was done in December of 2022. Um, and uh, just kind of split age groups. So a third of the respondents were 18 to 34, a third were kind of in the 34 to 55 range, and then a third were in the 55 plus range. Mm -hmm. And and so um, being able to get these results, um, you felt was was really imperative for this the the initiatives that you were you were wanting to take as an organization that's why because i as i said to kimberly polls can be expensive and they're time consuming so you felt that you were inspired by what uh, vegto went did and you thought this might be the right tool to get where you needed to go yeah and doing cost benefit analysis is a pretty uh, you know it stands up in public policy essentially more than some of the other methods of communicating um you know it, using data can 
can be helpful and having a cost benefit analysis is kind of the next step on top of that to say, yeah, we've done our due diligence and we know that this is a, a meaningful change beyond, you know, animal welfare, the other big impacts. Um, and so, so Amy, just for those that might not be familiar with, with cost um, benefit, um, tell, tell us a little bit about that and how you use that in, in, in your work. Yeah, so um, kind of from a public policy perspective, when any kind of, let's say, government institution is making a decision that has something to do with economics, um, they they have to gather data to make that decision. And so using a cost benefit analysis is the most common way of um, using kind of financial data. So they'll couple that with um, public opinion, they'll couple that with industry opinion, um, and, and it's sort of a full package. And so it's not so common for nonprofits to be doing cost benefit analysis reports, um, more in the environmental sector. And so we decided to bring that in to kind of say, you know what, maybe as an institution or as government, you're not making the decision to do these analyses. Um, so we'll do it for you and, and we'll put it right in front of you so you can't deny it essentially. Mm, I love, yeah, I mean, it makes so much sense really when uh, animal rights and veganism, everything around animal protection isn't at the top of the priority list for government, um, corporations or whatever, it's, it, it, it falls to us to, to, to make it a priority, to be able to get um, all of the pieces that they need, you know, even if they're sort of half engaged, if we give them all the pieces and they're like, oh, this is easy, I guess I can do this, um, then then that that's really how we have to get through at this point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So one of the purposes of polls, you know, is to help empower the vegan and, and animal advocacy movement um, and, you know, to get that data that we can build on. Uh, so we AJers are ready to build. Um, how about we have you share some of the pieces of the poll that you think are particularly important that we know? And Amy, I'm going to we'll start with you um, because your poll is brand new and it's actually not out there like the numbers aren't out there. Um, and you're going to reveal everything on April 11th, is it? Uh, April 13th, I April think. April 13th, is the plan. okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, you're, this is like the first sneak peek, folks, that we're getting into the poll results. And so, Amy, why don't you just take it away? Do us, oh, I might have to, no, you should be able to st still screen share. I think um, Chantel is going to do the screen share. Oh, okay. Got is it, it possible to give Chantel permission for that? Yeah, she should already have permission. So, go for it. Great. Thanks, okay. Chantel. Um, so, so we'll just move to the, the next slide. Um, the, the polling was in the greater Vancouver area and um, certainly the biggest stat that we were surprised by is that 65% uh, of surveyed British Columbians have already reduced their consumption of animal products. And that's, you know, more, more resounding than we expected. Uh -huh. um, certainly the top three motivations that we looked at for why that's happening. The, the biggest was personal health followed by economic reasons and environmental concerns. And then animal rights was kind of the, the last in that grouping. There were a few others that were even lower. Um, interestingly, uh, GTA did the same kind of the GTA residents responded similarly with that personal health. Um, but the economic reasons was the lowest response other than other um, in VegTO's survey. And so that potentially speaks either to the high food prices in BC or the increase in food prices between the time that that survey was done and the time that we did our survey. So um, either way, we know that personal health is is by far the biggest motivator. Mm -hmm. But but just just to note, Amy, it is really good because there's a lot of talk in the movement about how little people care, you know, about animal rights that they're going vegan mostly for health, and it's actually kind of evenish between those four things. I mean, yeah, it's the bottom, but it's not that far off. So that's I actually find that stat quite heartening. Oh. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, and I, I think we can talk more about that um, later. I think there's there's a lot of takeaways from from those stats. 
Um, I'll just continue on through yeah. a few more of the, the polling Absolutely. outcomes. So cost was certainly a big thing we wanted to look at, you know, doing a cost benefit analysis, but understanding some of the qualitative ideas around costs as well. Um, so 92% of those surveyed were concerned about how rising costs uh, of in, kind of would impact their finances. 87% uh, were looking for ways to cut back at the grocery store. Wow. Um, 75% were looking for ways to change their diet to eat more affordably, and 84% were adjusting their food purchasing behavior as a result of concerns about finances. So really, food purchasing was a, a huge decision um, around cost. Um, and then finally, this 66% somewhat or strongly agreed with the statement that they're open to exploring more plant-based food options to save money. Um, so we weren't sure how much cost mattered. It turns out it matters quite a bit um, when it comes to making decisions about food. That's really good to know because, again, would not have guessed that. No, no, ex exactly. Um, but <laughs> one thing that was really interesting from that is this uh, kind of stat on the left side of the screen um, that despite clear evidence that there's, you know, concerns about costs, uh, essentially 28% of respondents felt that their food costs would increase if they were transitioning to a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And that tells us that there's an opportunity for public education around how shopping plant-based can actually cut down on grocery bills, uh, as that seems to be a common misconception that plant-based foods are actually expensive um, mm -hmm. when we know that it can be really affordable. Well, and again, just for us vegan advocates and animal rights advocates here, um, we often are, are sort of because we're we're actively putting out the vegan diet. And so we're getting back a lot of the time. It's so expensive. It's so, so we think that's a, a prevailing attitude. So it's again, it's actually good as an activist to know that it is only 28 percent that believe it. And we know, of course, that's wrong. The vegan diet is considered was considered at one point the pauper's diet because it's so cheap to be able to to live on. So, yeah, so really interesting, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we also uh, essentially asked about food choices and influenced um, just as in the greater Toronto area poll, um, greater Vancouver areas, food choices were also most influenced by taste. Uh, and that ties in with the main barrier that we heard shared about transitioning away from an animal based diet, which is the fear that I won't enjoy my meals as much. And um, that 37% of the respondents listed that as, as one of the barriers. Um, but essentially the, the top factors are taste and then price and availability when it comes to influencing food choices. And then this kind of goes back to that topic we were talking about a little bit earlier around um, how much does animal rights or welfare attitudes influence um, food choices? And um, so Kimberly, maybe you weren't surprised. We were surprised, um, you know, to, to hear that um, only 29% listed that in the top three reasons for why they've changed to a plant-based diet or, or switched to a more, you know, switch some of their food choices to be more plant-based. Yeah. Um, some of the other stats that came out of this. So 53% uh, strongly or somewhat agreed with the statement that they think about farmed animals when they're deciding what food to buy. Um, 18% was the amount that strongly agreed with that statement. Um, pet guardians were more likely at 59% to think about the treatment of farmed animals um, when they're deciding what food to buy. Um, Non-pet guardians were at 47%. So uh, there's a big difference mm -hmm. there. Um, and then only 22% of respondents shared that they would be interested in media and educational content on animal welfare as it relates to plant-based food. Um, so they're, the majority of the respondents essentially weren't open to that. Um, yeah, just I'll just keep throwing out the stats and we can yeah. chat about it a little bit more. Um, Go for it. Another interesting stat that came out was half of those polled believed that vegetarianism both hurts and harms animals. Uh, which really shows that contradiction that can exist in that diet choice. So we kind of did a spectrum where it said, okay, does vegetarian hurt animals a, a lot, hurt animals a little, both hurt and help, help animals a little, help animals a lot. And 50% kind of sat in that middle category saying it's it's both. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I mean, certainly I can I can see how um, you can kind of have different ideas about vegetarianism and um, you know if you're just replacing one animal product for another from from you know eating full animal products into a vegetarian diet, maybe that's not going to make an impact. But if you end up eating more plant based and you're eating vegetarian, maybe that is going to make a bigger impact. Um, so in general, those stats indicate that more work needs to be done to engage the public in a meaningful way about plant-based eating as it relates to animal well-being. Um, but until that time that there's more recept receptivity, uh, we really think it's beneficial to focus on the aspects of messaging about plant-based eating around personal health and affordability. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so we, you know, a big part of our work at VHS is influencing institutions and, and government. And so we did uh, quite a bit of questions around that. 65% um, of survey respondents strongly or somewhat agreed with the statement that they would eat more plant-based meals. There were more tasty options available when being out and about eating. Um, well, that does apply to private institutions. You know, you think of restaurants with that. It also you know, there people are making the same kind of choices in public settings, like purchasing from parks concessions, and also in settings like hospitals where they do have, you know, a, a menu that they're choosing from. And then about three quarters of respondents would view food, food services that offer a greater variety of plant-based options as more inclusive to all, which is a one that I'm pretty excited about. Um, that's yes. something I've been saying for so long that that's what we need to focus on is the inclusivity of providing plant-based options. And so that's what we found is people who don't even eat plant-based are seeing the value of inclusivity and we can share that with governments and institutions. That's incredible. And then that, kind that, of as we, that stat really, that stat really stood out for me, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to use it more mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when we're speaking with institutions and um, kind of smaller percentages, but still the majority of respondents uh, felt that um, animal product reduction efforts, um, they would support them. So at local, provincial, and federal climate, health, and animal welfare strategies that are being made, they think that um, animal product reduction should be included in those strategies. Very good. It's not a big majority, but it's still a majority. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then the final one, um, we're always talking about shifting subsidies from animal-based uh, products to plant-based. So we're curious about how what people's attitudes were towards that. And 58% 50 were supportive of that subsidy shifting. So still a majority of respondents. Mm -hmm. And Excellent. yeah, this data, it's really useful because it can be shared with institutions like schools, hospitals, nursing homes, and government to influence their food purchasing and menu decisions. It shows that the majority of the public does feel positively about increasing plant-based food options, and they would access them if they were tasty and affordable. Um, so in, in our experience of working with institutions, it speaks a lot louder when we can show that the people who are eating the food want to see change, even if they don't identify specifically as vegan or vegetarian, because those numbers, those percentages are so low. But if we can say, okay, 65% of British Columbians are wanting to eat more plant-based options, um, that, that speaks volumes compared to us just being an outside voice saying, oh yeah, people want this, but without having the data to back it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this one I thought was interesting from an advocacy perspective. Um, there's a few things on kind of information sources. So one of the things we asked was, where do you get your information from in general? What, you know, what, where do you absorb information? And the top three resources were websites and blogs, academic and scientific literature, and from family and friends. Um, I was surprised that academic and scientific literature was as high as, you know, second of the, in the list, but it's interesting to, you know, to hear that that's where people feel that they're getting the majority of their information. Um, and uh, that's a broad category, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's important for us to continue to, to reference literature and, and research in the messaging that we're doing. Um, they also 
we kind of asked if presented with information on plant-based lifestyles, what kind of information would you want? And the highest prevalence were personal health, cooking tips and recipes and cost. So that aligned very closely with what we already heard kind of earlier in the survey. And, uh, and then finally, we asked what types of resources respondents have come across that they found to be the most Im informative when thinking about plant-based lifestyles or what they would find helpful. And the top ranked responses were plant-based recipes, um, websites dedicated to guidance and recommendations, including nutrition, recipes, and fitness. And um, that was followed by information on social media. Okay, good to know. So not undercover um, gruesome of <laughs> photos is what we're getting. <laughs> I, think I we mean knew that, but you know, <laughs> good, good to yeah, just have that confirm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I I'm certainly you know reinforced by those things, but yes. not everyone is. No, and 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 really, those those sort of um, uh, pieces of of activism and exposure are are really designed to target people who are are on the edge, you know, are on the edge and are ready to, you know, become very committed. So um, I think, I think this just, yeah, really, just really confirms that the, that's going towards a, a more specific audience. This, if we're wanting to go towards a more general audience, we're looking more along those lines. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, well, so we'll be releasing the data on April 13th. And if you want more information, you can visit plantuniversity.ca. That's our website with, with all those tips and tricks that hopefully is making an influence. And we also have an email address there that you can email to be notified when it's released. Excellent. We and we've put that in the the comments. Um, Kirsten, maybe just I, I just want you to check that plant university link. It might not be going through the way it, it's it's hyperlinked weird so okay excellent amy this is that was wonderful and so good to get some of those stats and um and folks you know if you're like oh i want to use those stats we have a lot of ajers who are doing you know uh, work around plant-based procurement um you know trying to on a city level or government uh, uh federal level provincial so really great to know and also just on uh sort of outreach levels so um on april 13th You'll be able to get all the information on that folks at that link um okay kimberly let's get you up and let's get you sharing some of the um some of the data that you collected through the toronto uh, the veg to poll awesome thank you and i just want to say again veg.ca slash poll for the complete webinar the complete question set uh you can download it you can use it please do um it's it's available for everyone and so I'm just going to quickly share my screen here and just yeah, let you know absolutely. that um, what I emphasized were some of the key findings. And what I think I'll do is there are some interesting points that Amy brought up that I might pause and um, chat with you about some of the, the, the differences maybe or some of the similarities. But this is just a very high level overview uh, with some key findings for it that we found that were interesting. Perfect. Um, so let me just hit present here. Great. Uh, so we presented these results in September of last year, and these are some of our objectives. We wanted to sort of understand, strengthen the case and advocate and create evidence-based initiatives and outreach. So some of the demographic findings here, we touched on this earlier in our chat. Um, you can see here gender, age, um, and income education levels. I think it's also important here to see in terms of diet, um, how folks self-identified and um, diets in the GTA, these are some of the ways that we, we uh, allowed folks to um, identify their preferences. And finally, um, we wanna emphasize here that we had a very small sample size of vegans, 2.6% um, of the population, which is amazing because it's still 145,000 people, give or take, and growing. In so that's Toronto a area. lot. That's, yeah. mm -hmm. that's powerful. There's a lot of voices there. And we'll see some of the, the characteristics of the folks that identified as vegan here. Uh, university educated and um, age and how they went vegan. Mm -hmm. Next. So a really exciting finding. Um, Two thirds want to reduce their consumption, although they still eat animal products every day. And it was a significant 
uh, percentage, but two thirds. Wow. That's amazing. Right. Right. And specifically meat, meat. Um, we, we emerged as a theme here, everyone that meat versus eggs versus dairy. There still seems to be, uh, attitudes out there that these are, are different and helping to make that connection for people that, you know, your, your dairy cow is the same, it, that that's meat, that's dairy, uh, and, and more messaging around the connection of these animals is important for us as well. But two thirds want to reduce their meat consumption. That's really exciting. Uh, this was a thrilling finding as well, that 90 per, 94% of respondents support more plant-based foods in public spaces. And over half of those who identified as omnivores in the survey would eat more of these options if they were available. I think this really correlates to some of the results that uh, Amy shared with us. And it's very, very exciting in terms of um, advocacy and general support in, in having these options. I know that the, the, the other survey emphasized the accessibility. Uh, this one is just generally a positive um, a positive finding towards having more options available. That's amazing. That's a very high number to be able to show, um, especially government officials. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it sort of represents uh, a sea change in, in attitudes towards uh, plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. Influences on food choices. Um, the uh, Humane Society poll touched on this as well. Um, taste, availability, familiarity, routine, convenience, price. Uh, these are sort of the most important category of influence on food choice. And we didn't dig deeper into the reasons why taste are, uh, would be number one. But I think that Amy did a great job of sharing that um, folks don't want to miss their favorite flavors and meals. Uh, availability is one that we at VegTO can definitely um, pull as a lever in terms of our strategies and how we engage uh, because, for example, finding number four, 70% of respondents have tried vegan products in the last year. So folks are not only purchasing and trying uh, plant-based products, uh, but we'll see as well, they're also um, interested in having more plant-based options in public spaces and even places like restaurants. Uh, so like, for example, of, I'm seeing 29% uh, have tried a vegan cheese. That's, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, plant-based meats seem to be number one again, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but there was uh, all categories. It looks like folks have been consciously trying and purchasing um, these sort of products um, or, or options. And I think this is also a very powerful message for businesses and and others th that are providing products and services that there's a real interest um, more broadly considering that of course vegans again were 2.6 percent of the gta that we surveyed um, a lot of this is happening from that that 85 percent animal products every day folks mm -hmm. they are trying alternative um all, like plant-based milks meats etc trying um plant-based restaurants as well 36% said they have tried going vegan or vegetarian before um, and are no longer, wow. um, which is a, which is good to know. Um, and that's another, uh, for us at VegTO, this is another way that we can potentially reach and support is helping folks try and stay vegan and to provide them with the resources that they need to continue on with this, this path. Mm -hmm. And Kimberly, and I'll just insert for the AJers listening, sure. you know, that initiatives that we should really keep in mind are those initiatives to support people who are trying veg diets like Veganuary and ongoing sort of mentoring type programs. So, you know, I'm always trying to plant little seeds for our AJers as far as their initiatives go. So keep and going, if they're Kimberly. In the GTA, yeah, of course, if they're in the GTA, that's sort of what we do as an organization yeah. when it comes to um, inspiring people and supporting their their um, vegan journey. And uh, yeah, so lots of resources available on our website, veg.ca as well, everyone. Uh, five and six said they're aware of the environmental impacts of animal products. This wow. was a really interesting, interesting finding. Um, and what we got as a theme is uh, a lot of respondents were emphasizing the environmental aspects of 
plant-based lifestyles as a, as a motivator for trying out um, plant-based options and interest in veganism, um, the environment, environmental impacts really ranked very highly in terms of what people were thinking about and their rationale for reducing meat consumption or trying vegan products or trying a plant-based lifestyle. So that was a really interesting finding for us here mm -hmm. in the GTA that that seems to be a message that has gotten through to people um, about the, uh, the environmental impacts. That's really surprising because it certainly hasn't gotten through to governments. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's happening, but that's great. That's what we need is we need sort of mass public uh, uh, awareness to bring to our officials. <laughs> totally. And if if our goal is to meet people where they are, um, for me, whether it's animal welfare, whether it's health, as was a finding um, in Vancouver, or whether it's environmental impacts, for me, whatever the the gateway is, whatever the the touch point is that uh, folks are interested in, that's where we want to meet them. And that's what we want to emphasize. Because once we can engage with someone, we can certainly help them to, um, you know, make this choice and make better choices in terms of their their diet and lifestyle. Uh, but with that said, you know, five and six that they're aware, but awareness is different than actually changing practice. And people are avoiding these foods in practice um, for some of the reasons we discussed. And you'll also see in this statistic here, for example, that people are avoiding red meat. Uh, these are still 10% of the respondents here that are omnivores um, say that they're avoiding red meat for environmental reasons. Uh, but if we look at things like chicken and cheese and eggs, you know, we get down they're below to- below soy. That's oh right. my goodness. <sighs> Yes. So there's there's still a lot of mythology out there around uh, the negative impacts of soy on human health. And again, that is something that we can speak to in our messaging and help debunk and demystify, because I don't know about all of you, but I thrive on soy. It's it's been an absolute gift in my diet. And, um, you know, it just to see how this uh, there's definitely some messaging at play here, everyone. And so our objective is to provide a counter narrative in terms of what we're sharing. Well, and I think, Kimberly, the really important counter narrative uh, when people believe that soy is worse for the environment than chicken <laughs> is that most of the world's soy goes towards feeding animals to be that are being raised for meat. So that is number folks please always hammering that home that most of the soy, most of the crops in the world, the majority are going towards feeding animals at a, an alarming, inefficient uh, rate of, of, of protein, um, uh, protein output. So I think that's a really an important piece to, to remember. 100%. And I'll also add to everyone listening, the relationship between red meat and cheese we look at the difference here, you know, to help make that connection as well in terms of, uh, I mean, specifically this was related to environmental impacts, but making that connection that cheese and red meat are sort of this one in the same and to help with that messaging as well, um, to help make the connection that the red meat that folks are avoiding for environmental reasons, um, these are also the, the, the animals that are producing the majority of our cheese in this country as well. Um, Great, great uh, positive result here that folks are open and we really see an adopt a uh, change in attitudes towards um, vegetarian or vegan lifestyles and, and um, more broadly. And the openness is, is the first step, right? And so to see that, you know, three and five were open to trying in the future was a really great outcome that we found. Mm -hmm. um, and an another one here, and I believe this is the final one on my highlights is that uh, vegan options at restaurants are a bigger motivator than vegan restaurants, particularly when we look at, you know, over 80% of respondents identifying as omnivores. And this really speaks to some of the results that Amy presented around um, having more options available and folks will, uh, people who identify as omnivores are willing to try those options. And I think that restaurants and public spaces and institutions are um, uh, an incredible touch point for folks who are interested in trying these options uh, and might be sort of a gateway into exploring potentially more in their own purchasing and in their own um, uh, their own eating habits as well. So uh, products as well as options in spaces as well as 
us as an organization supporting more restaurants having options available, more investing in their plant-based menus, investing in um, not just having a veggie burger on the menu, for example, because I think we can really show value here that folks are interested in trying these options and uh, that these can, can be a great investment for um, restaurants and other places as well. Um, helpful resources. We touched on this as well. And restaurants, you know, almost half of, of the uh, respondents cited restaurants as um, a helpful resource to trying uh, plant-based, as well as reps, websites, recipes, um, events, uh, et cetera. You'll see the results that are here. Um, notably that 21% are not interested in plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. That's okay because 80% are, so. No, 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 no. I just wanted to quickly, I know with our time here, I just wanted to touch on the four key or I believe five key findings from our uh, cousin organizations and their questions, because I think they're super important. And one of them here is from animal justice. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the partners that we worked with. These are the other organizations in our space that we invited to ask questions to our respondents. And uh, the first is 55, first finding is that 55% of respondents felt that diets are healthier with animal products. Wow. Uh, this was from the friends. Yes. That's a high amount. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So um, this is a, something, again, this is a, uh, um, this is something that people believe. And this is also an opportunity for us to communicate the benefits and, and the health benefits of uh, plant-based eating and vegan lifestyles. 87%, uh, this is the question from animal justice, support passing legislation to protect farm animals. This is a very high result and across the board. And so some of the same people that are not interested in plant-based foods or believe that animal products are, are healthier in the diet, they still support in large majority passing legislation to protect animals that are being, uh, being farmed in this country. Uh -huh. So the undercover videos do work, just not to make people plant-based, but to make them want to change the laws. Okay, well, that's a start. <laughs> and it, it does it does show an awareness. And um, I know that um, Amy mentioned that, um, you know, we don't know whether these are folks with companion animals or otherwise, but we do know that 80% of the total, just over a thousand respondents, believe in, in that this is an important um, that supporting farm animals through legislation is important. 70%, um, we, we partnered with Reimagine Agriculture and 70% of respondents said they would be willing to try cell-based meats. Uh, so we also know that meat doesn't necessarily need to come from, from animals themselves uh, and that people are interested in trying um, these alternatives. Uh, one in three say they learned about animal welfare, or agriculture in school or university. Uh, so that's, it was just under 30% or so. So that's really interesting about embedding sort of these conversations into our education systems really help bring awareness to, to the subject matter. And finally, uh, from our friends at the uh, Vegetarian Food Bank, one in six respondents to this poll have experienced insecurity, food insecurity in the last year. Mm -hmm. So that was prior to what we're seeing in the increase um, yeah. in food prices and other things. So this was already too high of a number. Yeah. And I'm sure that that number is increasing. And so there's an opportunity here for messaging and support from, from us and from here at VegTO and from you in sharing how cost-effective uh, plant-based eating can be uh, mm -hmm. for, for individuals as well. Amazing. .ca slash poll. Thank you all so much. Wow. Okay. So I just felt like both of those presentations were like a roller coaster ride. I'm like, oh, that's a great set. Oh, oh, that's a great, you know, it's just... I mean, but in the grand scheme of things, it's good to have the data to be able to work, to work off of it, to be able to use it, to fuel future things in a more um, targeted, uh, informative way. Um, so Amy, anything that you see, anything that Kimberly mentioned that really stuck out to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it just shows it's, it's no longer taboo, like, like plant-based mm -hmm. eating is, is talked about in a way that 10 years ago it wasn't and and just asking year over year of the way that it's being represented in our grocery stores the way it's being talked about in households and and now we're seeing that through the statistics mm -hmm. 
Kimberly, um, in the Toronto poll, it, uh, it was found that 10% of the GTA is flexitarian, which you defined as primarily vegetarian with occasional meat or fish. And then the 3% were identified as pescatarian, 3% as vegetarian, and 2.6% as vegan. So all combined, that means 20% of the GTA restricts or abstains from animal products, um, you know, consciously. Right. So, yeah. So um, the other thing is I found it really interesting that the vegetarian and vegan numbers are almost equal now. It used to be like vegetarian was 5%, uh, veganism was, you know, 2.5. Now it, they're, they're equaling out. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we foresee that if we did this poll again in even five years, uh, we're going to see an increase in the number of vegans, I think, relative to vegetarians overall. And I think part of that has a lot of that is coming from young people as well and their interest in, in adopting this lifestyle. Yeah. And that's the other question I wanted to ask both of you is, is demographics wise. Um, I mean, we are hearing that there's basically a veg revolution happening with Gen Z. Um, and, and was that reflected in your polls? Would you say, Amy? Yeah. Yeah. Just before I'll share our data on vegan vegetarian first. So we had um, 2% identify as vegan, 6% as vegetarian okay. and 6% as flexitarian. Mm -hmm. um so a little bit different which is interesting because we have you know just as many vegan restaurants in, in vancouver i would say as mm -hmm. in the gta um but in terms of stats around youth um so of those who shared that they were open to diet change or animal welfare concerns um or you know had animal welfare concerns 77 percent of the youngest group that we surveyed um said they were open to exploring plant-based food options to save money um, so that's something, you know, going back to that cost consideration that, you know, that population is struggling with student debt and all kinds of issues. And so if we're going to target them, money and affordability might be the best angle um, for making a difference there. Mm. And Kimberly, what did you find in your poll around that age group, younger, younger folks? They were driving um, a significant percentage of the positive outcomes that we found and um, there was also, a, they were also the most likely to be influenced um, less on taste and more so on things like friends and family. And it really showed, there was a, a real sense that this cohort um, thrives on connection and community. And that was a, a real, um, the, the, the price finding doesn't surprise me. Uh, certainly I remember what my budget was like when I was at that stage of life. Um, there was also this opportunity to um, find like-minded individuals and create community around these things. And that was a, a definitely a, a much higher percentage than, let's say, folks that are over 50 or 60 um, who weren't really interested in, in um, uh, being in community with other like-minded individuals in the same way. They sort of, the folks that were vegan in that cohort, which are a much smaller group, uh, sort of had made their decision and perhaps were vegan for a long time mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so if we're thinking about how to apply some of these numbers, um, you know, as as activists here uh, today, uh, one would be to, you know, create more um, cost effective platforms for um, aspiring young vegans like uh, there have been, you know, in the past call, you know, veganism or vegetarianism for college students and things like that. But, you know, uh, projects around that would probably be really helpful and more sort of connecting these young groups of aspiring vegans as well, you know, having more community um, type um, uh, platforms for them. Um, so another question that I have actually, Ken, um, if uh, uh, there's a couple of questions here in the chat, Ken asked, has there been any thought of polling just restaurants and retailers about plant-based food options to get a sense of their perspective? Now, I know this sort of falls in your purview, Kimberly, because that's where you're wanting to put a lot of your um, efforts and, and uh, VegTO has in the past. So what's the next step? as far as corporate and restaurants and everything go with this, these results? Well, uh, uh, being in social innovation for a long time, uh, I, I do believe in the power of culture as a transformational uh, tool. And I do think that um, businesses and even policymakers uh, will often follow the cultural shifts that are happening, that are happening faster and first. And so 
Uh, I love the idea of pulling businesses to get their sentiments. Uh, in terms of an organization with little, limited resources, I also think that it's very important that we get these results in the hands of those uh, businesses that have the opportunity to say, wow, there is a real potential value here, a visible value in me making the investments in this, um, in offering more plant-based options or uh, offering more plant-based products as well. Mm. And Amy, there's demand. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you're on that. And I love, you know, because I am really surprised by how open people are. How, and I think that was a really important stat to remember is that um, people were far more concerned with vegan options, plant-based options in restaurants rather than vegan restaurants. And so many of us, again, in the vegan movement, we are, and it's very important for us to support all vegan endeavors. Like, you know, we need to support the people that are, are doing great stuff that are in our movement. However, it is also important for us to get out and support vegan options in omnivore settings, omnivore, you know, um, uh, restaurants. So I think that was a really uh, a takeaway for me. Amy, what is um, what is one of the bigger things that you VHS is going to move on now that you know some of this data? Like, how, what where, where are you most going to sort of put your energies on going next with this data? Well, certainly um, loading PlantUniversity.ca with more recipes. Um, you know, on the individual side, trying to put recipes in different languages, um, different styles of recipes, keeping short, engaging videos on how tasty the food is, you know, show tasty food. Um, that's kind of the individual side. On the institution side, it's about getting the stats in front of institutions so they see that this is a, a groundswell, that there's a big movement happening. Um, I was in the hospital with a friend recently while um, she's doing chemotherapy and could, going through the menu of what what she could eat right and and she's being offered things and she's like I don't want to eat any of what you've offered me and you don't have anything that's reasonable for me to eat and so having to even just as a person in a hospital negotiate um trying to eat reasonably <laughs> to a diet that you already hold is hard and so that touches on that inclusivity piece and I think there's a lot of opportunity to engage with these institutions and and show them that what they're doing is is actually causing almost harm at this point and they can make really meaningful impacts for people just by having tastier more exciting plant-based options when they're offering that up to their patients or residents Mm, amazing. Now we have put um, uh, several times put the links towards the your poll data or about to be released poll data. And one of the other really great things that uh, the polls are wonderful for that I've always you know felt the polls official polls are wonderful for is media. So Amy, are are you going to try to get some media? You know, get a bit of a media splash on this when you release all of the results on the thirteenth. Certainly. And we're we're kind of parsing it out into different topics so that we can have multiple media touch points rather than trying to, you know, blast all of the data at once. Because we know the more kind of angles you can put forward to the media, the better the odds are that you're going to get a bigger impact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I you you both both organizations have incredible resources um, that are are wonderful for passing on to potential um, vegans. Um, Amy, tell us about the Plant University. Uh, so Plant University is uh, essentially has an institution stream and an individual stream. So it's a kind of dual purpose website. Um, we advertise on an individual stream, mostly recipes, blog posts, interviews with uh, people who have gone plant-based. And, and then on the institution stream, it's more about what marketing resources we can offer, what support, um, you know, we can actually help them develop recipes. We can um, sample things. You know, we have a variety of what we offer there. And so the website essentially showcases all of that. Mm, amazing. Um, so that's plantuniversity.ca, right? That's right. And Kimberly, 
um, something that anybody who lives in the Toronto area has lived off of for years, and that is the Toronto, the directory, the veg directory. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So on our website, we have a button right at the top that says vegan near me, and you can go right now from your laptop. It's completely free to use and you can triangulate based on your location, um, uh, trusted partners with vegan options available to you. Uh, the majority are all vegan uh, restaurants, but we are increasingly trying to reach out to those folks who have made a meaningful investment in their vegan menus and include those resources as well. So you can really search, and this is GTA uh, focused for everyone. Uh, we also have an amazing program we've had for decades and we're looking to, to really invest in, which is our discount program. So for just $25 a year, you receive membership to our organization, inspiration to your inbox every single week, um, as well as uh, a card that provides you with a discount at over 60 GTA businesses so that you can really get out there and support and try um, the, the bounty and continue to ensure that these options are growing that are available to us. Yeah. And I think it's good for, uh, you know, we've got lots of folks that aren't in Toronto and Vancouver, but just to recognize are these resources available where you are? Um, is, is there something that covers your area? And if not, is there an organization that you could lobby to do that or you know, help to head that up? So always a really great thing to do. Um, I'm really curious in the chat before we wrap up folks to find out what is um, a stat that you learned today that really stuck out to you um, and that you might sort of use, uh, or, or if you are going to use a stat in something you do, an initiative you do, outreach you do, or whatever, I would love to hear that because um, that, that can really, uh, you know, it can really help guide us as well as to what to get out to the activists out there. Um, I know I've kept you over time, folks, um, as usual. <laughs> I'm not, we're not very good at cutting it off when we, but we, we lost Amy for a bit. So we, we, we wanted to make sure that we got everything in, in here. Um, so uh, Kirsten, if you can bring us back to uh, Unspotlight to the gallery so we can see the faces of the folks again in the crowd. And Amy and Kimberly, just make sure you're back on gallery view so you can see everything everybody. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of uh, things that people said. Carrie said, too much great info. Yeah, my head is a bit spinning too around this. Um, Tenebrae said, big stat, cost of food is primary driver. Yeah, that one was really big for me. Diane, um, oh, sorry. Kirsten said, 87% support passing legislation to protect farmed animals. So encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, keep them coming, folks. I want to see them. But while we do that, everyone, can we please give a great big thank you to Kim Kimberly and to Amy and VegTO and VHS for the wonderful work you're doing out in the world. Thank you so much. Um, you are two so-called local organizations that pack an incredible national punch. So um, I, I really, really am excited about um, all the work you're doing and how you're expanding um, uh, the conversation around plant-based eating and veganism. All right, um, AJers, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, we will see you again in two weeks. And we also have a panel coming up, an evening panel coming up. So please stay tuned. Um, if you're not already signed up for Animal Justice Academy, Dot com. Please make sure you are, and that way you will get all the notices of what comes next. Um, thank you. Uh, lots of love. Uh, Justin says, anyone else feeling warm and fuzzy? Yeah, I, I am Justin. <laughs> Um, and also, folks, if you love our programming, please don't forget to donate to our animal justice uh, donation button that uh, Kirsten put in or is going to put in. There we go. Um, it just helps us to keep doing the programming and the campaigns and the all of the work that we are doing, not just at Animal Justice Academy, but at Animal Justice. All right, everybody, have a wonderful week. Again, happy spring, and we will see you soon.